Luis receives his bachelor's of science in microbiology and chemistry from the University of Puerto Rico at Humacao in 2016. He worked at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and University of Bergen before starting a PhD at UC Berkeley. Luis is currently a PhD candidate in the Department of Plant and Microbial Biology. His PhD thesis aims to advance the science and the technology of genome editing by discovering and harnessing. And something that I found really fascinating uh, when I heard about Luis is that when he was younger, he didn't actually uh, think about becoming a scientist, let alone a scientist at UC Berkeley. And he actually um, used Pokemon to help him remember the different uh, CRISPR segments. And I'm sure uh, Luis will expand more on uh, his journey to uh, coming to where he is today in his keynote himself. Um, but yeah, he's going to be talking a lot about CRISPR and gene editing technology and uh, the positive impact that his work has uh, with everything going on. So um, before I steal too much of his thunder, I'd like to turn um, our attention to our keynote, Luis Valentin Alvarado. Thank you so much for that intro, Alison. Right. Um, let me share my screen. Yeah, so uh, it's a great pleasure uh, to be here today. I mean, through Zoom. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, uh, as uh, you probably know, I'm from Puerto Rico, a small island in the Caribbean, um, and I have been you know, traveling different parts of the world through science, it was kind of great. Uh, but at the beginning, um, everything was gonna like, oh, I really like science, but I don't know if I'll be able to, make, to be a scientist. I'm the first member of my family to be a scientist. So it's kind of uh, challenging at the beginning, but everything started when I was in school, by the way, uh, participated in the Intel ISEF uh, 2011 by the way, in San Francisco. And that was amazing. I met other great high schoolers from different parts of the world and everything started in high school with a great science teacher. So I'm really happy to be here sharing that um, experience with you and what I've been doing at UC Berkeley and at the Innovative Genomics um, Institute. So today we'll be talking about a very interesting topic, CRISPR, and you might be familiar with the Nobel Prize in Chemistry that was awarded uh, recently, a couple of months ago, um, to Professor Jennifer Dauna from UC Berkeley and Dr. Emmanuel Champertio from France for the development of a method for genome editing. And that was a great, that's a medal, Nobel Prize for uh, Jennifer Dauna. It's kind of cool. So, uh, I also did get some chocolate cool um, as well. So, and I want to set the stage with this um, question about what if it's a cell's DNA could be edited just as a text document. And thinking about that, you know, it's basically if you can cut the sequence and then paste it and repair that, and it can, uh, okay, there you go. And then repla um, replace that and in the genome in a single cell. And that open other question about potential treatment and other applications as well. So I want to start, first I want to start um, telling you about CRISPR, what they are and what they do for bacteria. And then um, I'm going to tell you how understanding CRISPR immune system in bacteria allows scientists to harness it as a powerful technology for gene editing and other applications, for example, for, example, for COVID-19 detection. And finally, I will discuss the importance in agriculture, biomedicine and society. So let's start diving in into the uh, biology. So just as briefly uh, a reminder, the green cell is a bacterium, the yellow um, is a bacteriophage or a virus that has a DNA inside. And I wanna start with this image um, to remind you that bacteria and archaea are constantly being invaded by mobile genetic elements. Like in this case, a single bacterium that is, has been infected by all of these phages and over the course of their evolution, bacteria have evolved a complex set of mechanisms to fight these infections. 
And microbiologists were like very interested in this um, arm race. Um, and basically they found uh, different ways that these bacteria were able to protect themselves by different mechanisms. But recently, probably like 10, 15 years ago, um, Professor Julian Banfield from UC Berkeley and other um, scientists looking genomes, basically studying DNA sequences, they found like something uh, very peculiar um, in these genomes. And it was basically repeats and spacer. And in, is this is basically a CRISPR um, log is showing the um, CRISPR that basically stands for cluster of regularly inner space short palindromic repeats. I know, cute and a little clunky, too long. It's CRISPR is the acronym. And this sequence is known as a CRISPR. And interesting, in, interesting property is basically a short repeat showing the uh, green diamond. And then this space that basically is a sequence derived from viruses. So for the first time, they show, hey, wait a minute, a bacteria has a adaptive immune system. And also they find other cas associated proteins that co-occur with these repeats. And that was very intriguing for Professor Gillian Bam from UC Berkeley. And she contacted Jennifer Downa, basically Googling a biochemist at Berkeley, and they met together at a cafe and they were talking about this interesting and enigmatic um, uh, mechanism. And Jennifer started thinking about, oh, we can use this maybe as an application. So now um, I want to show you a short video about the system and how it works in the actual nature. So we're looking at bacterial cells and viruses arriving in the environment, basically leading to an infection. So viral DNA is injected into the cell. And so CRISPR system has the ability to capture small viral DNA sequences and integrate them into the CRISPR locus in a very precise pattern that has repeats and the spacer that I previously described. Then, uh, the bacterium makes a copy of the CRISPR sequence in the form of RNA. CRISPR RNAs chop basically uh, in a small molecule and small RNAs that includes from a virus um, that combines with another tracer RNA that then can combine with a protein called Cas protein. And in the laboratory, the two RNA molecules can be connected to form a single guy RNA. And it's a surveillance system that will search in the genome and once finds a perfectly matched sequence will land, unwind the DNA double strand and, and cut. And then from, if we think about the virus, basically that will degrade and it's basically an immune system in bacteria. But think about other possibilities if we can bring this into lab laboratory and try to do the same in other cells. And that was bringing me to the actual technology. This basically is a, um, 3D printed model that shows the Cas9 protein in white holding onto its orange guiding RNA molecule and interacting with the DNA do double helix. The great thing about this protein, it is very easy to change the sequence of the guy RNA that is in orange and, and then you can do it for all sorts of research. By changing the RNA sequence in the system, we can direct the protein to interact with any sequence uh, interested in cutting. But you might be thinking like, that sounds cool, but what that has to do with gene editing and COVID the detection? Well, let me tell you, understanding a bacterial immune system and DNA repair mechanism is really crucial, a basic science that allow us to create new biotechnology and applications. And since, you know, Seeing is believing. Let me show you. This is basically a um, a atomic force uh, video that is showing the Cas9, this um, big thing here, and DNA. And you will see. Pay attention how the double strand of DNA is cut. It. So it's basically landing and winding, and then look, it cuts, cleave the DNA. And that was really amazing to see a, a video that this system is actually working pretty well. And 
But going back to the application technology, so all genome editing begins with a cut. And here we have a genomic DNA, double strand DNA. Think about CRISPR system as a scissor that uh, cleave that double strand DNA. You cause a break and two things can happen in eukaryotic cells, plants and animal. You can have random insertion of DNA that basically this gene is not going to be longer functional or you can have a donor of a DNA of choice and you can insert a piece of DNA to give a new function um, to the gene. And think about like most of the um, genetic, genetic, genetic disease are caused by mutations. So this is really important to us to understand the system really well in order to do the actual um, application. And if that's, you know, if, we, if it has DNA, we can edit, we can edit it. And think about different organism, thinking about your favorite organism, thinking about plants, and it's basically open a huge different possibilities for genome editing in a few years, basically. And now this is a very popular technology that has been used across the globe. Um, the possibilities are endless. We can start with basic research, fundamental discovery in cell function, development, how things are assembled together, medicine, new therapies, antibiotics, drug, drug, drug targets, diagnostics, and also thinking about, for instance, sickle cell anemia. This is the first um, ex vivo disease that was cured um, in a few years and has been the hot topic for the next ones, thinking about other um, applications. Agriculture as well has a great impact in different um, applications there as well. Um, but now I want to tell you about something that we are very interested in, and it's using CRISPR proteins for diagnostics. And this is basically um, the different ways that you can bring the sample in. It could be blood, it could be urine or cells. Then we can be DNA or RNA, depending uh, of the uh, application that we're going to do because we have different CRISPR proteins. Um, and these two different versions. And then basically one is a DNA, uh, one, one is an RNA guided DNA and looking for DNA. And the other one, Castor team is looking for RNA. And what we people did was basically in lab was try to engineer that sequence that basically will, the guy RNA that I mentioned earlier and add basically two fluorophore or two molecules that emit light once, once finds the, tar the target. And what it finds the target is basically emit the light. And that's really important because of the readout was that's really clever for us to develop different technologies. And it's a rapid sensitive detection for different um, infections, cancer, and SNPs. And this is you know growing and over and over. And when the pandemic started, you know, scientists at IGI or Innovative Genomic Institute were looking for how we can use CRISPR to basically detect COVID-19. So now I wanna show a really cool video that we made recently. And since I explained this, I wanna start um, when the application start. So basically, um, I don't know if you can hear this. For novel COVID-19 RNA. To do this, CRISPR proteins are added to the sample. The scientists give the CRISPR proteins directions to identify the coronavirus RNA sequence. And then they arm them with a molecular alert system. When the CRISPR protein finds the COVID-19 RNA, it cuts the strand. Then this triggers it to cut any nearby molecular alert RNAs, releasing light. As time goes by, more alert RNAs are cut and the light becomes brighter. The glowing light signals a positive result. This new technique could provide test results in less than an hour. And scientists are even working on different versions of this method to make rapid doctor's office and at home testing a reality. Using this fast and expensive approach could let us detect a lot of other viruses too. The future of viral diagnostics is bright. So that was a great and short video showing um, what we are doing at the IGI, which is basically using these CAS proteins to detect um, COVID-19, but think about in the future, other viruses as well. So. 
to recap, um, the ability to program the CRISPR-Cas protein with a guide and RNA sequence is great because now we have a, a technology that allows us to edit any sequence of DNA. And those are few of the applications happen and happen and happening are, are happening now. Uh, and the next year will be amazing to see other um, discoveries, but also applications as well in biomedicine, um, agriculture, and uh, other areas as well. So now let's talk about the ethics behind because this is really important uh, for me as a scientist because this is great, right? I just told you about an amazing technology that can edit um, any sequence of DNA of a given organism. That's terrific. However, uh, we have to think uh, ways that to make you know the best of the technology. So this was discovered in 2012. So we still need to understand better in order to go further to human um, application in human, because that's really that we care about thinking about ethical um, issues with genome editing. And Professor Jennifer Darna and many others have been thinking um, in different ways that they can, you know, get together and then think about how we can implement this technology without causing um, any harm to the human race. And this is implication in public, public engagement, ethics and responsible use, policy, law and regulation, and socioeconomic implications. And if you want to learn know more, there is always this annually um, conference called CRISPR, CRISPRCon that um, scientists get together and try to show the data, but also trying to think about all these different um, aspects that are involved in the society. And one of the most important thing is that is the germline editing. This is basically an uh, cell egg cell that has been injected with um, guy, with the guy RNA or CRISPR system to edit uh, a given DNA gene sequence. And this is great, right? This is amazing, but we are not there yet. We, you know, we want first to understand very well the system in order to do these great applications. And talking germ cells, sperm, eggs, and embryo, early embryos, uh, making changes into those cells that can be transmitted to future generations and this can, this can happen um, in any animal, including um, us. And that's we are... Um, sorry, Zoom was kind of crazy here. Um, so let's just um, talk about this quickly. Uh, somatic cell is that, you know, you can edit that cell, but it's, it's only one individual affected. It's not going to be transmittable for the next generation. Germ cells, they can be transmitted and basically it's the individual and also the offspring um, affected. And this is an amazing um, document that was uh, reported by the National Academy uh, about human genome editing, science, ethics, and uh, governments. And so basically now we have a, a toolbox that we can use for um, genome editing and think about the future of genome editing. It will be amazing that we'll be able to cure genetic disease and also improve um, agriculture and also understand other things in basic sciences such as development and other things. And thinking about superheroes is something that uh, if you watch Jessica Jones season two, they showed a uh, science paper talking about CRISPR. So I, I invite you to watch that, that season and they talk about CRISPR. So it's kind of cool uh, what they did. Um, just for the last thing I want you know, to tell you that we have free digital resources at the IGI. We have also asked, as a scientist, the student can email question about CRISPR or scientific uh, project, science fair project question. We're happy to answer those. We have animations and also we have graphics, glossary, and other things. So yeah, with that, I wanna you know, thank the IGI for Innovative Genomic Institute, um, my laboratory and friends and colleagues as well. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Luis. And with that, uh, we'd like to open it up for questions. So if you have a question for Luis, um, feel free to type them in the chat. I'll give you a few seconds or a while to type your questions. So I guess I can start. Um, I'm curious, I mean, gene editing and uh, CRISPR seems extremely exciting, but what made you decide to go down this path specifically? Or were there like other areas of microbiology or science you uh, were interested in, but decided not to go down instead? Or like, um, what brought you specifically to um, CRISPR? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. <laughs> so basically, yeah. Uh, I didn't come to Berkeley to work on CRISPR, to be honest. So I, when I came here, I just started thinking about trace metal chemistry and looking how like microbes use trace metal for their metabolism. But I did a rotation with uh, Professor Julian Banfield, and it's basically using the metagenomics and using a lot of Python coding to look into genomes and look sequences. And in during that rotation, I learned about CRISPR. So we're working on the CRISPR system for the very enigmatic bacteria. And then to that, that um, we had the middle one, Professor Jennifer Dauna. I was like, this is kind of cool. And I ended up working on CRISPR that way. And it's been a very cool journey, um, learning, learning a lot. CRISPR has proteins, there are over 100, I mean, many CRISPR proteins and they go Cas1, Cas2, Cas3. And to memorize them, I had to use the analogies of Pokemon, right? When I used to play Pokemon and had to memorize all the names. So I had to memorize all the different cast proteins. So that's always a funny story about CRISPR. Okay, I see um, questions coming in the chat. So the first one is, um, is there a place uh, where, I, or I would like to know if there's a place for reading more about CRISPR? Yes, for sure. Yeah, if you go to the um, www.innovativegenomics.org, um, it's the IGI where um, we, I work and we have plenty of resources. We have videos, all the videos that I showed here, they're available there. And also a glossary and, and other great things as well. So you can go there. I think I got the right website. Um, the next question in the chat is, um, is Python or R better for analyzing genome data? Oh, that's a very interesting question, depending. So we, I use a lot of Python, a lot of Python, but I use R for stats. So um, yeah, there is a lot of Python using Python for genome, um, to analyze genomes in different ways. Is CRISPR being used on people right now? If um, not, when do you think it will be? Yeah, so the first um, human trial was in a patient that had sickle cell anemia. And that was the last probably three years um, started happening and it was cured by that disease. So if you wanna learn more about, I can post the news about that, but that's the first case. And now it's, I think like I, this morning, I saw news in Twitter talking about editors big company genome editing in Massachusetts um, submit the first treatment for DTCs um, to the FDA. So it's happening and it will be um, sort of um, getting more attention. But this was ex vivo. So that's what I explained about like um, germline and somatic cells. This has been in somatic cells, not in germlines. That is not allowed yet. Because that will, will be um, transferable to the next generation, and we we are not there yet. So we'll, we'll be, but in in, in a, the next years, but we need, as, a, as a we mentioned earlier, we need to understand the system really well first before going ahead with the technology. Okay. Uh, what concerns do you have for the use of CRISPR in healthcare to give some genetic uh, quote unquote advantages, someone asks? Yeah, so um, the, one of the you know, things that I'm worried about CRISPR is that 
it's a powerful technology for good, but also it could be for bad things as other technologies, right? It can happen with other technologies because thinking about healthcare that now we, we you know, thinking about two possibilities, right? We have a great system for the good of things, but also um, now think about if we find a gene that is involved in the IQ or the intelligence or a faster athlete. So we need to think about to control that and then work with healthcare um, to get you know advantage into that. But you know, it will be coming the next 10 years. Those um, conversations are happening now, the ethic behind. Um, but yeah, there will, it will be a great implication and it will be an important conversation with healthcare and, and also um, policymakers as well. Um, okay, uh, there was one question which I skipped, which was, um, can CRISPR be used to create cells? Um, CRISPR can be used to basically edit any sequence of DNA. So you can use CRISPR, let's see, if you want to make cell metal, then you can use CRISPR, right? Like think about genes. If these genes encode for um, all the components of a cell, you can basically either shut down that process to show that, you know, we, you don't, you don't want to, you know, finish this cell development of the cell development, or you can enhance the activity if it's mutated. So to create, to cre create cells that are otherwise you can create cells. So CRISPR is really good doing like repair. Like when you're, you have a typo, right? And you want to fix that, copy, basically copy, cut, copy and paste. That's what CRISPR does. We can, um, erase and we can uh, replay with the new, new uh, DNA sequence. Okay, so someone, um, this is a, sort of a follow up question. Um, how is CRISPR regulated or how is CRISPR being regulated? Regulated by, um, you mean like biologically or by? the government um i well, i didn't ask the question okay. but i you, you can say both yeah so biologically is basically um if the bacterium cell is lucky enough to have a crispr system right and then when the phage is infected there is regulated by different processes it could be by translation transcription there are different processes inside the cell that can regulate that pathway but what triggers crispr is basically a phage in um, ethic or like the government is basically regulated by this um, document that I just mentioned, the human genome editing um, doc that was compiled by the National Academy. And there is regulations there how you can use. CRISPR can be used for research. That's the most important part. Um, it can, you can buy CRISPR on Amazon and use it for yourself. That, that's not allowed, but you can use it for research. Um, Oh, I really like this question about, um, can CRISPR be used uh, to find cures for two viruses like COVID-19 easily? Yes, that's the great thing about CRISPR because you can make it programmable. So if we know the genome of that virus that we think that maybe in the future will, will emerge as a pandemic or like a virus strain, then we can design guy RNA to find that sequence. And then when you find the sequence, you have light and it will be easier. Once you have the genome of that virus, it will be it will take only less than 45 minutes. And recently um, they developed a really nice technology that you can you can use your phone basically for the testing. Um, and I can send more information about that. You can find more information about that at the IGI website. Um, so I have another question here privately. Um, some of the COVID 19 vaccines use RNA sequences to code for antidotes in their human body. Can CRISPR be used to isolate the RNA for the spike protein from COVID 19? Um, yes, CRISPR can be used to find the sequence of the spike protein, but it has to be at the RNA, at the um, DNA level, right? Or RNA. So since COVID 19 is an RNA virus, we have to use a different version of Cas protein that will find a RNA. Um, sequence and then emit the light. OK, 
Okay, and then I think this is an important question because we are a teen audience. Uh, what advice do you have for high schoolers who are looking into careers in STEM but aren't sure where to start? That's amazing. That's a really cool question. That's my favorite one. Uh, yeah, so I ask questions, right? Like it's difficult to find. Um, for me, what it worked, it was asking people around. Like I was just emailing people, like grad students, you can email, even you can email me and you know, we can find, we can, it can help you to find resources. Um, looking other, like um, the usually schools has this um, STEM career office that you can find there, but look into your passions, right? For me, I was, I never thought, you know, again, that I was going to be working on CRISPR or in microbiology, but I was, my curiosity, I was driven by curiosity. I was asking questions always and looking to solve problems. And then I enrolled in a microbiology degree and I started, you know, keep asking people for help. And, you know, how do you get there? Or like, what are the resources available? And to be honest, there is no perfect route to be a scientist because I asked many people in my trajectory and never found a per perfect path. Um, you have different you know, mentors in your career, uh, but the most important is find those mentors that will help you and guide you through that process. It could be peers, it could be high school teachers, it could be professors from universities, it could be grad students, undergrads, and ask questions and then find your passions and then you know, start building um, that uh, career. But the first thing is you know, start asking questions and look in different perspective in STEM careers because there is academia, industry, and there are two different things that are um, amazingly both of them. Okay, well, uh, th thank you so much for that um, amazing keynote. Um, so I'm gonna start sharing my screen again. So, quiere continuar la conversación con Luis a una sala separada en Zoom, abierto a todos que quieren aprender más. Si no quiere uh, ir a, a esta otra sala, al breakout room, si puede escuchar a mensajes de video por todo el mundo de expertas de la tecnología y la salud por India, Francia y Sudáfrica. So we will be opening up the um, Spanish breakout room in just one second. Um, and so if you want to ask uh, Luis any questions that you still have um, in Spanish, um, feel free to join him in that breakout room. Um, so if you don't wanna join the breakout room, just stay in the main room. We'll give you a few seconds uh, or half a minute to join if you're interested.